Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to the uh, third meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are switched off? It is, of course, uh, okay to use mobile devices for social media, but not for filming or uh, photographs. Uh, agenda item one is an evidence session with Health Improvement Scotland. Can I welcome to the committee Denise Coyer, who is the chair, Robbie Pearson, chief executive, Ruth Glasborough, uh, director of safety and improvement, and Dr. Brian Robson, medical director of Health and Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Um, I think Denise, you're going to give us an opening statement. Yeah. That's okay. great. Thank you very much. My apologies, I've got a dreadful cold, so if I splutter at you a bit, um, apologies. Thank you very much, Convener, for allowing us to make some opening remarks on the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. This is a really welcome opportunity to demonstrate to you the way our organisation is making a difference, and we really welcome your scrutiny of our organisation. When we begin a piece of work, we ask a fundamental question. How can we best help our partners from health boards to the new integration authorities provide the very best care possible each and every time for each and every person they support? And by doing this work in Healthcare Improvement Scotland, how can we best help patients or people receiving care to have a good experience of care and a better experience of care? So to fulfil this role, his is uniquely positioned um, as a provider of three things. We provide firstly improvement support, which can be tailored depending on our partner circumstances. We provide evidence for improvement, and that includes clinical guidelines and advice on best practice. And we provide public assurance on the quality of services that are provided. I can't emphasise enough the value of having improvement, evidence and assurance, along with the public voice, all in one organisation. It's a simpler and more effective organisational structure to improve the quality care of care and we should be proud of it in Scotland. And many other countries are now seeking to move to that, uh, adopt our way of working. I want to bring to life for you the breadth and variety and scope of our work because in the complex and changing environment we work in, there's no single easy solution and I think we all have to remember this. Our role in Healthcare Improvement Scotland ranges from supporting people to have their say on the design and delivery of services, to approving new medicines for routine use in the NHS, we inspect hospitals and other services to drive improvement, and we help our partners design solutions to the challenges they face. As an organisation, we work with a wide range of partners and other organisations, and we get to see and understand the full picture of health and social care delivery. And that has helped us support improvement in a range of areas. It's our knowledge and overall understanding that gives us value. But you don't want to hear about processes of what we do. I think you'll want to hear about the impact and how we measure the value of our work. So, for example, the first phase of our patient safety programme has helped deliver a 17% reduction in hospital mortality, supporting the staff in our hospitals to save more lives. The one I'm most proud of is that the safety programme has helped to drive a 21% reduction in 30-day mortality for sepsis and blood poisoning, and again saving lives, especially young lives across Scotland. On mental health, the safety programme has supported improvements at ward level where there have been examples of reductions of up to 70% in the number of patients who self-harm, 57% in the incidence of physical restraint having to be used, and 78% in the incidence of physical violence on the wards. These figures come from some of our most disturbed wards in Scotland, where staff have been working with mental health patient groups and patients from the wards to deliver these outcomes. And I think personally, when you start fixing mental health, you know that you live in a civilised society. We are also expanding into new areas to reflect the integration of health and social care, which puts people right at the heart of delivery of services. Our new improvement hub is a key part of this, and we are forming new partnerships across the public sector with organisations like the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations.
An example of the impact of focusing on housing can be found in work that was originally led by the Joint Improvement Team and now sits within Healthcare Improvement Scotland's Improvement Hub. Support was provided to the Western Isles to improve the service which provides equipment and adaptations to individuals' homes. The service keeps people in the community and enables timely discharge from hospital. And in addition to enabling people to live independently, the work has also delivered efficiency savings by significantly increasing the level of recycled equipment. In 2012, under £10,000 of housing equipment to help people live at home was recycled. In 2015, that had risen to £400,000. A high profile element of our work is around assurance and we conduct unannounced, in-depth, robust inspections. At its core, this means that you can read our inspection reports and know how well services are performing, from how clean your hospital is to how well it cares for older people. We have processes in place to escalate concerns directly to ministers, but it's more than just about inspection. Instead, we use the inspection process to drive improvement and share good practice and areas for improvement. For example, the number of requirements that are contained in our HEI reports has reduced by 50%. That means that our hospitals are being kept cleaner by staff that are better trained and informed. To take a specific example, our HEI inspection of St John's Hospital in Lothian in 2010 resulted in seven requirements and two recommendations, while our latest report in 2016 shows there were no requirements or recommendations. So far I have described the impact of some of our work, but it's through the combination of our roles that we can deliver the most sustained and substantial improvement. And to illustrate this, it's worth considering how our combined role works around the quality of care for older people. In collaboration with partners, our work ensures that older people can expect to receive, firstly, better designed care based on the latest evidence in our clear sets of standards, more reliable care through our support of implementing improvements in, for example, frailty and delirium, and be assured that care is of the highest and consistent quality through rigorous independent inspection. For example, we worked with NHS Ayrshire and Arran to reduce the number of older people over 65 who needed to be readmitted into hospital from 16.3% to 11.6%. This means more older people are cared for in their own homes with all the benefits that brings. I believe our wide range of functions puts his in a unique position. We're able to work across our powers to support improvement in a comprehensive and strategic way. It may be useful to compare that to other organisations and systems where you might only be able to see one part of the jigsaw, not how it all fits together. It's clear there's still very much for us all to do. We know we need to keep on improving and adapting. Health and social care services do remarkable things every minute of the day. But as an organisation which exists to support these services to improve even further, we do acknowledge the pressures they face. In these challenging times, and they are challenging times, with rising demands for services, and most importantly the competing demands between acute and chronic care, Healthcare Improvement Scotland has a crucial role in supporting these services to remain sustainable for the future and I look forward to his continuing to make a real difference for people across Scotland. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, and I think we would all commend you on uh, the, the positive uh, things that you've just explained in your statement. Um, I wonder if I could begin. Um, the uh, core aim of Health Improvement Scotland is to improve the quality of healthcare and to increase the effectiveness and value derived from it. That appears to be your core aim. Given that the NHS in Scotland missed seven out of eight of its key national performance targets, um, would you say that your uh, his is succeeding or failing in that core aim? 
I think, um, you know, I think what we are trying to look at is the overall picture. And I think you're aware there is a review of the targets at the moment. Um, I think there are definitely challenging times ahead, and we've certainly started to look and address some of that. So, Robbie, I don't know if you want to pick up on some of that. Um, yes, very directly. Um, clearly, in terms of the Audit Scotland report, which was uh, quite stark in terms of the, the challenges facing um, health and social care in Scotland, is set out um, the performance. Now, one of the, the key things for us as an organisation increasingly is to look at the totality of the quality of care provided in Scotland. So, for instance, one of the things that we look at now increasingly is about the leadership, it's about the workforce, it's about how sustainable services are. Now, that's not a place we've necessarily been before in healthcare improvement in Scotland. And I think increasingly we're going to be looking at um, the many dimensions that impact on the quality of care and of which the workforce will be a fundamental part of that. So we have an important role to play in shining a bright light in terms of the quality of care in Scotland. And I think in the demonstration of the openness of our reports, for instance, that we can demonstrate um, a very independent and an objective uh, approach in terms of our contribution to that. Thank you very much. I think um, one of the things I would say actually is targets hit acute care. And I think one of the things I ended with in my talk is, is this real tension about the pathways of care and the management of really quite chronic conditions in the community. And I think one of the issues that we have to ensure going forward taking a whole picture around things, is how do we actually work upstream um, a bit more to actually prevent some of the pressures that are coming into acute care? Brian, I think you wanted to come in on some of that. Uh, if you don't mind, the, um, you mentioned uh, um, Harry Burns' review, Sir Harry Burns' review of targets and indicators, and uh, Harry has spoken to this committee. We are actively involved in that review of targets and indicators. All of the work that we're involved in as Healthcare Improvement Scotland focuses on outcomes. So we have measures of uh, and indicators around our work. So we're feeding some of those examples into Sir Harry um, to make sure that the areas that he's looking at, and he, I understand that we're now looking at a broad set of, of indicators and targets, looking at population health, quality of care, and value in healthcare, as well as the staff and patient experience. So our work contributes to that, and we would like to see much more of our work uh, evidenced in some of the main targets and indicators. So how, how, do we, how do we then know what you're doing is impacting on improvement or not, if, if we have seven out of eight of the main performance and, uh, standards not being met? Um, would, it, would it be eight out of eight if you weren't there? Well, I think I, I would actually continue to push the whole principle of improving targets by pushing a lot of work upstream. And I think, um, I think Ruth would like to probably answer that because I think the important thing to get at with targets is um, if we keep doing the same things that we're continuing to do at the moment, the way we run ac acute care and chronic care, we're going to continue failing. We have to change the way we run health care in Scotland. And I think that's part of the work we're beginning to do at the moment. Okay. So, so if I could just talk the committee through briefly our work around living well in communities. So this is work to help the system to make the changes to reduce admissions into hospital and to support earlier discharge from hospital. And our approach around our improvement support offering focuses on helping the system to understand their local opportunities for improvement, to design or redesign services to address those opportunities. We support them practically with implementation, and then we support evaluation by collecting local measures to see if the changes are making a difference. With Living Well in Communities, we identified, using the evidence base and our evidence arm, a number of areas where we know there are real opportunities to make changes. Um, and one of those areas is around anticipatory care planning. So to take an ex a very practical example of Glasgow Partnership, what we've done with the Glasgow Partnership is we've worked with them, we've worked with the data so that they've been able to understand where are their real local opportunities for improvement. Um, on the back of that, they have identified a number of areas of work, um, and one of those is around the anticipatory care planning work. And the support that we provide um, includes then looking at practically 
what can we do that helps that local system to implement anticipatory care plans? We know they make a big difference in terms of admission to hospital. We know that between 5 to 6% of the population has complex needs that would benefit. We know that the evidence shows that if you have the right information available um, in the system, you can reduce admissions by up to 30 to 50%. We know there's a big variation across Scotland around who has ACPs um, and some of the very practical work we are doing has been around supporting the design of templates to make sure that systems are collecting the right information. We've done work with the electronic key information summary nationally so that that information is available electronically when somebody presents at A&E. In 2016, we saw a 20% increase in the number of ACPs on that electronic system. We've also been raising awareness across Scotland around the importance of ACPs, working with partnerships and boards, producing practical things such as video and practical toolkits. So it's all about supporting the system to make those very practical improvements. And if I can take it right down to a patient level, because I think that's quite important in terms of the impact. So these are two real life stories of two individuals. One was Margaret. She uh, had an anticipatory care plan and the other was Jean who did not have an anticipatory care plan. Their circumstances were very similar, their conditions were very similar and actually Margaret who had the anticipatory care plan, she spent much less time in hospital, she managed to die at home because she, this information was available to everybody supporting her about what her needs and wishes are and Jean who didn't have one, she had a number of admissions to hospital with all of the costs that incurred and she eventually died in hospital. So it is working right through from the national level right through to the very practical impact for patients and individuals using services. So how do we find that out then? How do we go and find out what you do and what impact it's having? So we have information available on our, our website, we have information in our annual report um, one of the areas that we're looking to strengthen at the moment is how do we uh, make this information much more accessible uh, because we have various communities of practice site, we have various case studies that are open to clinicians and practitioners doing the work of improvement um, and I think one of the issues for us at the moment is about uh, that's available to the clinicians doing the work, it's available to the managers, how do we get more information out into the public domain about this kind of work. There's, a, there's another way of uh, measuring it though as well because the bottom line with that practical example is that um, the new Glasgow City IGB has had a budget allocated to it. We're responsible for quality assuring their commissioning plans so we would expect <coughs> to see in those commissioning plans that they have actually put the resource into anticipatory care planning because the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow uh, to reduce the amount of people coming in through a uh, and &E department, it requires Glasgow City and the other integrated bodies um, that have been set up in the west of Scotland to actually use the resource they've been given to actually deliver anticipatory care planning. Uh, Convener, it's an important point in respect of outcomes and impact in terms of the £25 million that's spent in healthcare improvement in Scotland. We uh, publish in our board papers a measuring our progress report, <coughs> excuse me, which sets out very much the demonstration of increasingly uh, linking our investment in terms of our budget against impact. And I'll give you a very practical example of that beyond improvement support. So, for instance, in Scotland, there's a, a very high um, uh, end technical, technological procedure in cardiac care called the transiotic valve implantation, which is an alternative to cardiac surgery. We provided the evidence base to support its use in Scotland in a way which was more focused than would otherwise have been the case, and that saved the NHS in Scotland £2.6 million. So we need to demonstrate as an organisation in terms of that investment from a health care improvement Scotland, our share in the return on that investment as a public body. Colin. Thanks very much, Convener. Can I just touch on issues around the governance arrangements that you have in place? It's obviously quite quite a complex process, and particularly the oversight you have on your various constituent parts. Last week, we obviously took evidence from the, the Scottish Health Council, and I think it's fair to say there were a, a number of concerns raised by members um, of the committee, which I think reflect public concerns over the performance and the role of the, the Scottish Health Council. So can I ask, first of all, how independently 
does the Scottish Health Council and the other constituent parts operate from yourselves? And what performance management do you actually undertake over the various parts? I think we can both answer that, actually. Um, I think the governance arrangements in terms of healthcare improvement Scotland are relatively straightforward in that we have a board, um, which I chair, that provides governance. More recently and importantly, we have to provide governance arrangements across local government as well because we're working right across the public sector now, so that's a much more complex arrangement. Um, we have governance committees and, for example, one of those governance committees um, is related to the iHub and improvement. Now that governance committee has to have an ad advisory board um, uh, on it which actually has representation from um, local government, uh, social work, housing, third sector. Um, so we have to have in terms of our improvement work governance arrangements inside Healthcare Improvement Scotland that feed up to our board um, that actually have participants from all of the third sector. Because of that change to working across health and social care and the sector, um, I have reconfigured my own board at the top um, to reflect that by having members from the third sector and from having uh, individuals from local government on that board. The Scottish Health Council um, is, is a a governance committee of Healthcare Improvement Scotland and therefore is managed by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and performance managed um, and is answerable, uh, the director of the Health Council is answerable to the chief exec. We have commissioned a review of the Health Council um, because we feel that the work of getting the public voice and public representation can't be contained particularly within one area it now has to extend right across um, both quality assurance, improvement and evidence. And in fact, our public partners work across all of these areas. Our review of the Scottish Health Council, which is due to be published, I think, Robbie, me, you might want to talk us through that a bit. OK, thank you. Um, in terms of the... I'll come back to that point in a moment. But in terms of the governance arrangements, the accountability um, runs to myself as obviously the accountable officer for Healthcare Improvement Scotland. But the other thing I would add um, into the mix is that the Scottish Health Council has its own identity in legislation in the Public Service Reform Act. So there's a, <coughs> a bit of history there which needs to be recognised as well. In terms of the review um, of the Scottish Health Council, it is to do all the things that um, Denise has referred to. But I think importantly, and I think we touched on this last week, in the context of the integration of health and social care, that we need to think more broadly about not just patients, but about citizens and how they engage uh, with services. So that review will be um, ready in uh, late February, early March, and I think that will be the opportunity to look at some options for the future, and then we'll take these recommendations back, and indeed this committee has expressed an interest in, in making sure its voice is heard into that review. So, so if a member of the public has a complaint about the Health Council, you effectively deal with that complaint. Is that the case? And is that not an example of effectively marking your own homework, so to speak? If, if they are part, effectively, of the same organisation, but a complaint about them basically goes to yourself. Well, can I, can I tease out two issues? One is about accountability and one is about independence. Um, in terms of accountability, obviously I'm accountable for the overall performance of uh, the Scottish Health Council, but I've also got a responsibility to ensure that it um, has credibility and remains independent. I've got an accountability in terms of its performance and any complaints that come in I need to assess and respond to. So I think that's a, a very clear governance and accountability line. But, but you're, you're effectively responsible for their performance though. So if somebody complains about the performance, you then make a determination <laughs> as to whether or not that's a valid complaint. Is that uh, not uh, a, a conflict? No, I, I don't believe it's a conflict. I think it's upholding the independence of the Scottish Health Council as much as I uphold the independence of our inspections. And um, it's important that as part of that whole performance thing about the credibility and independence, there's an accountability there which I need to deal with, and that's through, uh, for instance, as you refer to complaints. So, so if they're independent, what is the point of them being part of your wider structure? Well, I think, separate organisation? I, I, well I think there's a number of opportunities which Denise um, referred to. We have an opportunity in Scotland, in healthcare improvement in Scotland, to do something quite unique in bringing together evidence, quality improvement, um, quality assurance, and increasingly importantly, the citizen's voice. 
And that mix and that blend is a really important um, ambition for us as an organisation in telling the whole story about the experience of care. And I think that embedding of that together within one organisation allows us to take from the bedside, the patient opinion, the experience of individuals, all the way up to the boardroom in terms of the quality of care delivered by the leadership in NHS Scotland. So, so can I ask just a general point of the panel, and are HIS therefore currently content with the voice of patients within the NHS? Well, I can certainly answer that. Mm. No. Is the answer to that, absolutely not. Um, I think actually we've got a long, long way to go with that um, because in terms of uh, when we, we have inspections, we have patients on inspections with us um, and they talk to members of the public and they hear people's views um, and they reflect them back um, and they also write parts of our inspection reports for us. Um, but we're, we're in a learning process of how to do that. The public are involved in new medicines and the public are involved in all our evidence guidelines. The increasingly they're starting to drive drive um, the selection of guidelines because there, there have been problems in the past where people, um, and particularly clinicians, no offence to the clinician at the end here, but um, decide to write a guideline about um, uh, what their pet subject is or what they've got the most evidence in, whereas members of the public would say we actually need some evidence about something that really matters to us. So a big one at the moment for us with the public is they would genuinely like to know what new services that the integrated bodies can develop that will actually make a substantial difference and stop them having to go into hospital for things. Now, we don't know the evidence base for that at the moment, so we've had to ask our colleagues um, in knowledge and evidence about can you start to look at some of the evidence that actually matters for things for the public. So we'll still continue to do really worthwhile things like the asthma guidelines and everything, but we do need to actually <coughs> involve the public in discussing that so when you ask is the public voice heard no it's not um it's it's not heard around that it's also not heard in genuine adult discussions because when i did my opening statement about acute care and chronic care and the tension between the two the nhs and social care in scotland has got a finite budget that's going is, is really a problematic. Um, we are going to have to decide in Scotland, it's a public debate about how much we're going to spend on state-of-the-art techie acute care and how much we're going to have to spend on chronic care that shouldn't be in hospital and should be out in communities. And we need to know how to shift these budgets. But for the public to have that truly genuine debate, they have to have the facts and knowledge at their fingertips about uh, what decisions people want to make about that. So when you asked about the Scottish Health Council, at the moment in our review, we would like to see the public voice far more through all our work in Healthcare Improvement Scotland so that they can genuinely say, well, we actually don't think this is a great idea and we have a constituency body. Now, the citizens' panels that we've set up are beginning to start to do that, but you can only ask them one question at a time. Um, and I think the, the, what I would like to see in Scotland is a far more honest debate about do we want to spend the money more on chronic care or do we want to continue to have... Um, the seriously high-tech acute care because it just gets more and more expensive um, and if, we, if we're going to be the best in the world in acute then we need to spend the money on it and that's but that's a public debate sorry for a rant about things I, I don't want to separate the two issues because that, that's a wider health debate what I want to look at specifically though is your current effectively enforcement of the the current role of the health council it seems to me if you're unhappy with the role that's being carried out at the moment you're not really enforcing any changes on the Health Council at the moment. You haven't made significant improvements to the work of the Health Council, despite the fact you obviously have that performance framework role. Well, well I think I want to recognise that, as Denise said, this is an, an evolution here. How do we strengthen the voice of the citizen in terms of making some big choices about the future priorities of health and social care in Scotland? I think there are a number of things though, that the Health Council is already doing which should be given credit for. So you've had the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman here talking about the complaints process and how the Scottish Health Council um, suggested a more uh, robust and earlier engagement in terms of the management of complaints. That is a demonstration of the work of the Scottish Health Council in building a more, um, uh, I suppose, responsive and a less defensive complaint system. So there's really good work already underway in the Scottish Health Council. What we want to do is to, is to build on that. 
and to think about then how do we strengthen the citizens' voice in decision making and make sure it's a genuine debate. Sorry, one final question. Just, but are you the right body to do that? If, we're, if I'm highlighting the fact that there is widespread concern over what's already happened in terms of the, the, the patient's voice, and, and you haven't made significant changes, from what I can tell, are you the right organisation to basically enforce those changes? Well, I believe we are the right organisation to do it, and, and the reason we're the right organisation to do it is because increasingly we're looking at the totality of the comp uh, quality of care, and if we're going to do that in a way which isn't just about the clinical experts giving their view and we want the voice of the citizens, well, it's fundamental that we have that voice, and uh, right in there from the start. And I think, actually, um, your point is that if we didn't have the Scottish Health Council within us, for example, we would have to create something else to get that voice um, because we can't uh, start to look at overviews of services and support the redesign of services without having the public voice in. So we would have to actually recreate it. And that's why we've actually set up the review um, of the Scottish Health Council is to look how we're actually going to do that better. OK, Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the a comprehensive explanation of what Healthcare Improvement Scotland does and thank you for coming out to my constituency and meeting with me personally to, to go through it. Um, I'd like to follow on from Colin's questions in particular in relation to some of the evidence we got last week about the work of the Scottish Health Council which obviously sits in your stable. Um, now I'm looking at the website of the Health Council here and I, I think it's you know it sounds like an organisation as you just said Denise that if we if it didn't exist we'd have to invent something like it and I'm glad that it's there if it's delivering this role and it says and I read from the council website our aim is to improve how the NHS listens to you values your views and experience respects you as an individual and involves you in planning and developing health services good stuff um, it also then has a big colorful graphic which says working together to improve uh, health and social care your voice so it strikes me that that then gives the uh, health council two roles that's one of quality which we've talked about and uh, in terms of eliciting the views of patients we learned last week that despite 2.3 million pounds a year 14 bases um, the health council has elicited the views of only 1100 people or thereabouts um, that's less than 100 per if my math is right. Um, I'm also anxious that when we talked about you know, the, the views on major and minor <coughs> service redesigns, particularly in major service redesigns, we're averaging about one a year view offered by the Health Council. It strikes me that this is a conduit that patients have to um, influence change within the S NHS that is stifled at best. Um, can you tell me, well, firstly, offer me your reflections on those views? Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the number that was shared and which you've just um, uh, expressed again in terms of the 1,188, that was in relation to a particular initiative by the Scottish Health Council, one initiative um, in terms of engaging with communities about stronger voice. How do they get a stronger voice? That was just one initiative. Okay. In terms of 2016, though, just short of 13,000 people um, is the number that the Scottish Health Council has engaged with directly over the course of the year. The numbers who engage through the website or also social media is tens of thousands more than that. So just giving you an assurance that that number is in that context okay. was a particular initiative by the Scottish Health Council. In terms of the, the, the wider point, in terms of the, the policy versus engagement, I think one of the things that we were teasing out um, last week was about the role of the Scottish Health Council in that is a lot about policy, a lot about informing policy. But one of the things I think that has got a bit stuck in terms of the conversation is that threshold between major and non-major. And I think that's where I think some of the debate has got to. And one of the big things, I guess, around our voice and strengthening our voice is about how do you make sure all change is seen as just as relevant as the major stuff. Well, I'm gratified to hear that. And thank you for the clarification on the, the numbers. Um, on that, in terms of the distinction between minor and major service redesign, I think that's a very crucial distinction because obviously um, what the SHC decide is minor, for example, the closure of the CIC, um, is very major to some, um, some people. Now, I want to ask about how the, this, the quality assurance role you have here because I understand that you don't quality assure minor service Change. In fact, I have a, a quote from a letter to patient campaigner Catherine Hughes from Healthcare Improvement Scotland, which says that the, um, who was writing um, 
I think about the CIC and, and particularly around the decision making that led to this minor service change as the SHC decided. However, the SHC does not have a formal quality assurance role in this process, the letter says, and it would be the Scottish Health Council's role to halt the process. It would not be the Scottish Health Council's role to halt the process of NHS board engagement once a need for change had been identified. Why does the SHC not have that quality assurance role over minor service redesign? So that's um, a matter of history in terms of the guidance around major service change, and um, which which came out um, uh, f five or six years ago. And what it sets out is the role of the Scottish Health Council in twofold. One is about the engagement around the quality of individual boards engaging across the totality of service change. The role of the Scottish Health Council is at that point when it becomes in that guidance major service change to quality assure the the process and the, the ultimately up, max minimum of three months consultation. That's an important point. But in terms of the, the, the role itself, it's not expressed at present in terms of beyond major in the quality assurance role. I'm not going to preempt the, the outcome of the review in terms of Scottish Health Council, but one of the things that we wish to get into is just about that broader role in terms of um, giving confidence that every bit of change in health and social care in Scotland um, is as consistent and as good quality as the stuff that reaches the major threshold. Well, well, that's, again, gratifying to hear. I think we would all endorse that. Um, but for me, then, that means that the, the critical point in this uh, journey is the decision to make to, by the SHC as to whether that service redesign is major or minor. And um, and obviously, you know, if that's a subjective process, then for many people, particularly CIC is a great example, they would not see that as a minor service redesign. Can you just explain how that process happens? Well, well can I, just for clarity, confirm that Scottish Health Council role is not to decide <coughs> in respect of what's major. That's ultimately for ministers to decide. Right. The Scottish Health Council offers a view, and that is, in terms of the process, the right thing to do. Um, now... In the current process, so the, the position in respect of major service change and the designation of it rests with ministers. Could, could I raise, just to stand back from all of that minute, because I think it's an important point you, you raise about the CIC without getting into the CIC, um, but it's back to what my statement again about this tension, because one of the things that people get uh, are really concerned about is that often they have chronic illnesses and the response of the health service is to deal with the acute part of it. So Lyme's disease is a classic example of that, where you get a month's worth of treatment on your antibiotics and then you're sent off with no treatment whatsoever um, to cope with your headaches, your fatigue and everything else. And centres like CIC pro provide some support and care for that. And I think the discussion and the debate in Scotland has to be about um, when we have uh, disorders that you go past the first month of acute treatment, but people are really disabled for the rest of their lives with some... And, and I pick Lyme's disease because it's the hidden one, actually, in Scotland um, at the moment, and its, and its prevalence is growing, and it's really appalling that we're not doing more for these people. But where do they go? So they look at the CIC as a place to go, and I suppose my argument would be surely in the body of the whole of the NHS in Scotland we could provide far more support and recognition of chronic illness mm -hmm. and we should be offering that as part of the routine of everything and and for me that's the big um the big anxiety at the moment because I don't hear that conversation going on anywhere at present well I think I'm really keen for this not to be dominated by the Scottish Health Council. Um, uh, there are other issues, but I'm surprised it's taken a week for us to find out that actually they contacted 13,000 people rather than 1,000. <coughs> and I wonder why no one was able to correct that last week, but I'll leave that sitting there. Um, Donald. Uh, thank you, thank you. you to the, to the uh, panel for coming. And um, just picking up on your point about Lyme disease, as a m member for the Highlands and Islands, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that's on your radar because it's a very significant issue. Can I ask about the um, independence of HIS from government? Um, I think we all accept that you are a non-territorial board, but you do report to government, to ministers. Um, and I was also going to ask about your role in inspecting uh, hospitals. Um, you can be called in by government, as you were, for example, in, to Crosshouse Hospital last, last November to, to carry out an inquiry or an inspection. 
Leaving aside your role in terms of infection control, can I understand to what extent HIS instigates of its own accord inquiries or inspections into NHS hospitals? Well, I'll pick up the broader issue of independence and then I think um, <coughs> Robbie will pick up um, on the others. I think it's really important about who do we have to be independent of? So I think it's really important that uh, we have an independence from central government, but also now we have to have an independence in a new relationship from local government um, as well. And we also need to be independent from a lot of vested interests that, that can come um, knocking on our doorstep. I firmly believe as a chair you have to build independence. I don't think it just happens. I think you can appoint who you like and think, well, that's you've got an independent board or whatever. But having the right people in post, um, I don't think makes you independent. I think you really have to work at being independent. So for me, that's got two things. One is I think um, it's, it's personal. As a chair and as a board, I think we have to maintain our principles. I think we have to be apolitical. I think we have to be fair. I think we have to be truthful. And I think we have to be compassionate because the best care is not always the best treatment, actually. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Robson would say that to you. And importantly, I think we have to be free from financial incentives. So I think we have to grow a board that actually um, is based on principles. But then you have to demonstrate your independence. And I think we're starting to begin to do that through our reviews. And Robbie will talk about those in a minute. I think we're demonstrating it through sometimes difficult decisions and difficult things we have to say. Um, and I think also we're starting to demonstrate it by highlighting the challenges um, to government. So I think, Robbie, if you want to pick up on the, the quality assurance bit of how that works. Yeah, thank you. In terms of the specifics about our independence to act and inspections, it's entirely independent. So our inspections around the care of older people is informed by intelligence about where we go unannounced in the care of older people inspections. And that's the same for our HEI inspections. But One sorry, of the key... Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to press that. If, if for example, you ha there is an issue with a maternity unit in any hospital unit, in any, sorry, any hospital in Scotland, and you get intelligence, are you of your own accord able to go in and, uh, and inspect and inquire and report back? Uh, absolutely. So um, in terms of how we've evolved as an organisation, um, our independence has increased in terms of how we exercise that independence, and it's increasingly um, informed by intelligence. So, for instance, we were in the Beetson in 2015 with concerns about the quality of cancer care at the Beetson. There were a number of reasons um, why we were there, but it was prompted by specific concerns raised by the General Medical Council. We did not wait for permission to go there. We went and we produced a report within a matter of months. Okay. Can I follow up? It, it, um, you don't deal with complaints. You, don't, uh, you have limited enforcement powers. Um, and all that being true, and the fact that you, are, you ultimately report to government, do you agree with what is a wide body of opinion that what we need in Scotland is an in the truly independent health regulator comparable to the CQC in England? Well, if I can, can answer that, I think that I would be very cautious about um, introducing a regulatory regime to the National Health Service in Scotland. If you think about the accountability of the National Health Service at present, the um, accountable officers for the NHS board are personally accountable to Parliament. The accounting officer for the NHS is accountable to Parliament and obviously comes to, to this committee as it's Paul Gray. Um, if you introduce a regulatory regime, you introduce a different set of relationships and accountabilities and a different set of sanctions. Now, I would be cautious about that because I think the reason that we have healthcare improvement in Scotland is because we recognise that inspection alone will not drive improvement. There's a mix of approaches from evidence through improvement support and increasingly getting the voice of citizens. And I believe that in one organisation in Healthcare Improvement Scotland, we have something unique, and it's how we exercise our independence and our existing powers. So our powers have increased. We have now the ability to um, sanction the closure of wards. That did not exist before. So I think we have 
In terms of our view, as we believe we have sufficient powers, we will keep them under review, but I'll be extremely cautious about going down the regulatory route in Scotland. Brian, did you want to share? Yeah, just, just to say, I mean, this is an, an international discussion. Uh, all over the world, healthcare systems are considering, does regulation help? How does regulation fit in? One of the things that Healthcare Improvement Scotland does is we connect in across the world uh, and we take advice from across the world. So Don Berwick, an international expert in quality improvement, has made his views on regulation very clear in his English review after the Mid-Staffordshire um, incident. Uh, he's made it very clear that regulation has a role if done correctly, but regulation from the outside does not sustainably improve care. And that's the evidence that we're now seeing across England. And the CQC and others have been up to meet with us in Scotland to see how we combine the roles of improvement and external inspection at the same time in one organisation. And we're in fact meeting this afternoon with Health Quality Ontario, uh, who are meeting with us later on this afternoon, who are again interested in how we do this. There is no perfect way of, of, of doing this, but regulation from the outside the stronger that regulation gets, the more concerning the results. NH, we have very strong relationships with NHS Improvement England, um, and we're doing quite a lot of work um, with them and a number of other organisations. They struggle um, because they have a separate organisation in the CQC, so they don't have access, um, and they do have access because they meet, but they don't have direct access within their organisation um, to be able to use data. And I think Ruth could give you some examples of where that's really yeah, important. Absolutely. In, in terms of um, uh, the procedure, so if there's an inspection occurs and a report's written, uh, what happens to that? Is, is that shared with the, hosp say the hospital or the care home um, before it's published? Is it shared by the government before it's published? How, is that, how does that work? In terms of inspection reports, um, there is a draft issued for factual accuracy, and it is for factual accuracy um, to the board ahead of publication. Um, the Scottish Government um, see the draft um, report, the final version, before it's, it's, it's published, a few days before publication. Um, do, so there's a do very they robust... Offer, do, hmm? they, do they request changes? Sorry? Do they request changes? Um, no, no, Scottish Government, absolutely not. Um, this is an independent um, inspection. And um, indeed, for the NHS boards, when they can come back with factual accuracy, it is simply about factual accuracy. Could I ask Nothing then, if, if, if government doesn't request any changes, then what's the point of sharing with them beforehand? Well, give them uh, beforehand for, for a number of reasons. One is to give them um, advanced information in terms of what is coming into the public domain, and they may wish to prepare lines in response to that. But also re reflects the fact that there is an accountability relationship between the accountable chief execs and the accounting officer in terms of the director general for the NHS. Would that work better if you're an independent uh, body? Would that not be better just being published and then everybody gets it at the same well, time? It would slow it all up. Mm -hmm. I mean, Grampian, I think, is a classic example of that where um, there was major issues. And I suppose back to your point about people complaining, at that point we did. We do triangulate information where in Grampian it was the General Medical Council, the consultants themselves, patient groups who were coming to us and we met with them um, in Grampian. Um, and in that time and when the, the report was published, it was shared uh, with government not for any changes whatsoever but so that there, there was um, action taken about some of the serious problems in, yeah. in Grampian. So that was the value of it because you would have added another month um, on to uh, and slowed it down. I suppose uh, I think it would be important to talk about the value of the two um, of scrutiny and improvement together in a very practical way. Yeah. Uh, because it, it's, it, this is back round to our belief that you don't drive improvement in health and social care by inspection alone. It's really important to provide the practical support then to act on the issues that have been identified through the inspection process. So as a very practical example, uh, we know that there were issues in our acute hospitals around the management of delirium. We could have just consistently kept calling the problem out, uh, but that would have had limited impact. 
So what we did as an organisation was we then pulled our improvement resources together and looked at how we worked with the clinical experts. We looked at how we worked with the patients and the families because they were involved in this work. Um, we developed very practical assessment tools because one of the issues was that people with delirium admitted to an acute hospital weren't being identified. So how can we support clinicians to actually give them the tools to enable them to be identified? Another issue that was identified was that once people were identified, they weren't getting the appropriate management. So we then worked again with clinicians and with individuals and their families um, to put together bundles of checklists. So if somebody's identified with delirium, this is what you should do. And we provided practical support across Scotland for the rollout of that work. They're working very closely with our clinical communities. We brought individuals together. We do a lot of work around networking across Scotland so that what's working well in one hospital can be shared with another hospital. And on the back of that, we have seen, again, some significant improvements. And just to give you a couple of pieces of data, the mean length of stay reduced from 22 days to eight days in Grampium. We saw a 50% decrease in falls in two of the older people's wards in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Unidentified and treated delirium can often result in people falling. Um, if that then results in, a, in some instances, a hip fracture with all of the impact that then has on the individual and the costs. So reducing falls by 50% is really quite significant. And um, we also saw reduction in re-attendance at an emergency department for patients aged 65 or over from 26% to 8% in one hospital, and that was around our work around both delirium and the work we also did across Scotland around frailty. Um, so our belief is if you provide practical support, because most of our clinicians, most of our managers, and when I say most, I mean 99%, have come into the role to do a really good job. And part of our approach is how can we support them practically to make those improvements? Uh, Ivan? Yeah, thanks, Nina. Thanks, Pana, for coming along. To uh, talk to us. Um, I'm not from a health background, but I'm from a process improvement background. Um, I'd just like to explore a bit more some of those areas um, and, and how you operate there. Um, it was very reassuring to hear you talk with data, which is one of the, the cardinal rules. You're talking about process improvement. Um, there's perhaps an issue how it all joins up because... Uh, you mentioned there's a targets and indicators review going on, and there's perhaps an issue about what you're measuring, what's getting measured at top level, but, but leaving that to one side for the moment. I suppose what I'm interested in is drilling down a bit more into, first of all, the process you use to decide what areas you're going to focus on, because classically you would preto that in terms of what was the biggest impact financially or whatever, um, and what's got the biggest impact on the preventative agenda. So I'm interested in finding out how you tackle that, and then secondly, how you go through the process improvements themselves, and then... On the back of that, I'm interested in exploring to what extent the health boards play ball, if you like, to what extent do they engage, to what extent do you get resistance. And then finally, I want to go on and talk a bit about some of the financials around about that, but we'll come to that. So if you can maybe pick off the first two or three of those, I'd be very interested to hear that. Okay. So, so again, perhaps I can use living well in communities as an example of how we decided which areas to focus on. And it was the combination of looking at the evidence base um, so what does the evidence tell us are the key areas where if we focus we'll reduce hospital admissions and help people to live well at home. We also looked at the data, so we had quite an extensive piece of work looking at the data um, and pulling that in, and we pulled together expert opinion as well. And it was the combination of those three factors that then led us to say there are these key issues, anticipatory care planning, palliative care, um, intermediate care and reablement um, that we need to focus on across the system. Then translating that to a local level, we have this piece of work which is around um, high resource users. So these are the 2% of our population who use up to 50% of hospital and community prescribing resources. And we support partnerships then to do their local analysis to see who their 2% are and then provide practical support on the back of that to say, on the basis of that understanding, where are you going to target your redesign work? In terms of the, the very practical approaches that we use, you'll, you'll recognise them. They're all the, the, the standard approaches around continuous quality improvement. 
Um, so as an example, the work in Glasgow at the moment, on the back of that high resource individual work, they have identified palliative care as one of the pathways that they want to focus on because the data shows that that's where they could have a significant impact. Um, we have helped them to map their palliative care system across health, social care, third sector and independent care sector. Um, and we produce these summary visual maps. Be very happy to forward one to you if you're interested. They're great because they allow people to look at the system and see it as a whole in one go. We then help them to overlay data onto that map to understand where the key problems are. And as part of the work we've been doing in Glasgow, we've developed a questionnaire whereby we have a survey a whole range of different staff working across the whole system to get their views on where the key opportunities are and one of the next steps is to then also work with the individuals using services to get their views on the key opportunities. On the back of that we then work practically with an area to say now you understand where are the um, high impact areas where you can intervene we then provide practical support then around what we know works in other areas to address those issues. We also work very closely with NHS Education for Scotland who provide training um, because we know that it's really important that improvement work is led by people who work in the partnerships and the boards, clinicians, managers, practitioners. Um, so we both commission training and we help to deliver training and uh, Brian might want to say a bit more in particular about the work we've done with clinicians around training and giving them practical skills around quality improvement. Because we're okay. times yeah, 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 so I mean, we, we could have a whole conversation about this, um, but, but let me just give you one further example of how we use data and how we use the evidence base. So Scotland has some of the best data around diabetes of any country in the world, and I'm sure the committee have heard from experts in the field in Scotland. However, one of the things that came through that evidence base was, were we identifying patients who were admitted to hospital whose blood sugar had gone too low? Now, the data tell us that one in six hospital admissions uh, a, a patient, is a patient with diabetes. And the majority are not admitted because of their diabetes. However, 30 to 40% of those have insulin as part of their treatment. And what we were finding that in less than 25% of the time, a low blood sugar, a high, hypoglycemia was being recognised. Now, a low blood sugar is one of the most terrifying situations diabetic patients tell us they experience. So we put in place a piece of work. We studied the processes. We actually watched what happened, and we, we did process mapping, and we identified a series of failures within that. But as you would recognise in the field of engineering, sometimes the simplest things are the things that make the biggest difference. So they, they, they looked around the world and we saw there's this thing called a hypo box. So a hypo box is simply all of the things that you need to assess and treat a patient if they develop hypoglycemia. So when I went to see the hypo box, the hypo box is a Tupperware container. It's a simple Tupperware container with all of the equipment that you require to make it easy for the staff to do the right thing. And as a result, in, in wards in Glasgow, we're now seeing more than 80% of the appropriate response in the appropriate time. And this is dramatic improvement by process mapping and by applying simple methods. I'll just touch briefly on the, the fact that we're engaging clinicians in, in the improvement journey. We work very closely with NHS Education Scotland, and we now have almost 190 uh, Scottish Patient Safety or Scottish Quality and Safety Fellows now uh, trained through the training programme over the last seven or eight years. One of the important things to note there is that six other countries join that training program because it is so good. So we have input from Denmark, from Ireland, from Republic of Ireland, uh, from Wales, from Norway and from Sweden. Uh, so we have, we have input from across the world now looking to see how you actually improve care through the eyes of clinicians. Because as Ruth says, clinicians and managers come to work to do a good job. But if you don't help them to understand improvement, they find it very difficult to do improvement. I'm delighted to hear that. Um, if you do this stuff right, in my experience, what tends to happen is the costs start to fall away. And before you know it, you're amazed by how much progress you can make and how much money you're saving. Yeah. Um, which clearly is what the whole preventative agenda is all about. Are you starting to see light at the end of that tunnel? So I, I, should, I should have finished off that story about the Think Check Act, because Think Check Act, Check Act, although driven by the evidence and driven by the patient's experience of low blood sugar, one of the things that are measuring there is length of stay in hospital. And we're seeing reductions of between one and two days per length of stay per incident 
of hypoglycemia. So Stuart Ritchie, who's a clinician here in, in Lothian, Debbie Voigt, who's a clinician in Tayside, have been leading this work along with Thomas Monaghan in our organisation. So they're looking for that sort of data. And that's another thing that clinicians previously were not interested in that sort of data. They didn't think that money was important. Money is critically important, whether it's in drugs or treatments or some of the fancy stuff that we can now do. So the clinicians are now interested in how you can actually reduce waste and invest money better. Yeah. Well, and we get to focus on outcomes rather than inputs Indeed. and stop the sterile debate about the amount of money we're putting in and start worrying about what's happening in the process. Um, just my final question is exactly on that. Your budget has gone up from 15 to 25 million. I just wanted to kind of prod you a bit on that and see if there was some logic behind that. Yes, if I can. Um, the, the basis for the budget increasing is um, of around £9 million um, in, for 16 and 17 is a number of layers. Um, the principal layer um, of the extra money, around £6 million, is from our new responsibilities for improvement support and the transfer of responsibilities from the Joint Improvement Team, JIT, and Elements of uh, Quest, which is a, a Scottish Government support uh, team. So that was a large chunk of it. Another chunk of it was the £2.5 million extra we're getting for uh, integrated improvement resource support as well from Scottish Government. The, another piece of the um, increase is the £1.3 million that we now have um, in our budget for the death certification review service. So it's a combination of things. One is about extra funding for us to fulfil our roles, transfer our budgets. But I think one of the key benefits we now have is an integrated um, stream of income from Scottish Government in a way which we haven't had before, which is great news for, for this organisation. Alison. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to discuss the issue of standards for a moment, if I may. A recent Freedom of Information request by Sue Ryder Care found that no NHS boards were implementing your, well, all your standards for neurological services. So I wonder if you could tell us how often you update your standards, how you assess an NHS board against those standards, and, and what happens if a board simply isn't meeting them. Okay, in terms of the uh, neurological standards, we can come back to the committee on that specific in terms of uh, where we are with the, the refresh update and our approach to that. In terms of the broader point about standards, um, we need to recognise as an organisation that standards are an important part of our work. Now, the work that we do, for instance, in HEI, we use HEI standards when we assess the quality of uh, cleanliness within our hospitals. We have older people's standards when we assess the quality of care afforded to older people in acute hospitals through our inspections. Now, one of the things that we are doing as an organisation is um, reflecting the fact we need to update our standards. And we're doing that in a broader context, though, in respect of health and social care standards, which have obviously now been subject to consultation. And we will be using these new standards in a uh, relationship with the care inspector, for instance, looking at the quality of care. Can I just come back to, uh, my, my question was, how often do you update your standards? Is there a concise there, there, there is a, a, a process for, for reviewing them, and um, they, it varies according to the different standards that, that we're looking at. So, for instance, in terms of the standards around uh, breast screening, and uh, uh, as an example where technology has moved on, where the um, approach to breast screening has moved on, and the need for those standards to be updated. So it varies according to the different standards, and there isn't a, a set review time period, and we need to keep them under review all the time. And what do you, what action do you take if an NHS board simply isn't meeting standards? Well, in terms of, if we take, for instance, um, our HAI standards, um, we have a robust process. So at the conclusion of an inspection, we set out requirements and recommendations, and requirements um, are basically um, categorised in terms of uh, whether it's high or medium in terms of the risks. And for the high risk, we expect the, the board to have dealt with it within one month. And we revisit. We carry out unannounced follow-up inspections for HEI, for instance. If we are not content with the, the, the sustainability or progress or the responsiveness of that board, we can escalate to Scottish Government. And I think that just emphasises the point in terms of that accountability mechanism which, uh, which uh, exists within the NHS in Scotland. Okay. Um, I think standards are obviously key to quality and safety. And in 2014, you outlined plans to for more comprehensive quality and safety assessments, including examining staffing and mm -hmm. leadership. 
Um, have you implemented that new <coughs> approach and, and how do you rate current staffing and leadership levels within the NHS? Can I touch on terms of the, the, the approach that we set out in 2014? We're now in a, in a phased um, implementation of that, what we call our quality of care reviews. And the reason that we've taken forward that whole approach is we recognise that the workforce, the leadership, the effectiveness of care, the responsiveness of, of it are all dimensions of quality that we need to look at. So that takes us from the boardroom, the leadership at the very top of these organisations, right through to the experience of individual patients within wards, for instance. So that work's already underway and we've, you'll see examples of where that is already happening. So for instance, we carried out a review of hospital-based complex clinical care in Lothian and we published that uh, um, last year and that touched on issues of workforce and the leadership for that particular service. We are piloting and testing um, the quality of care reviews with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services in Lothian and we're also doing work with our um, NHS Grampian as well. So in terms of the quality of care reviews, we're building a momentum that will take us into a more complex, a more comprehensive um, assessment of the quality of care. In terms of workforce, I think you're the second part to the, the question, is we recognise the real challenges in the workforce. And one of the things that we recognise from our inspections is commenting not on the quality of care is important, but we need to increasingly comment about the system and the challenges within that system. A lot's about workforce and attracting people into um, demanding roles. Um, there's an, issues in terms of training and development. Um, so we need to increasingly look, in inverted commas, at the supply of the workforce coming in and to do it in a much more rounded way in assessing the, 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 the totality of the workforce and the challenges on that. But you wouldn't um, hesitate to comment if you thought that, that the workforce and any deficiencies were impacting? Uh, 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 absolutely. And um, so if you take, for instance, the work in, um, that we did in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary Review, um, where we looked specifically at um, the emergency department and the concerns about the, the, the quality of uh, care and workforce issues, we commented on it very directly. Can I, can I just add to that? I mean, the, the workforce, is, as Robbie says, it's not just about numbers. It is about mix, it's about training, it's about staff experience, as you would you'd well know. Uh, one of the groups that we run along with NES is what's called the Sharing Intelligence Group, where we bring together um, six external agencies in Scotland. We bring together Healthcare Improvement Scotland, NHS Education Scotland, NSS or ISD, uh, Mental Welfare Commission, the Care Inspectorate and Audit Scotland. And we meet and we review every, currently every NHS board uh, every year, uh, looking at all the data, including data around workforce. So workforce and workforce experience forms part of our assessment of every single board. And increasingly, and over the last six months, we've started looking at IGBs as well. Uh, but the workforce experience, for instance, through the General Medical Council trainee survey to see how junior doctors are experiencing safe, supported training environments are a core part of that evidence base that we use. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Richard. Thank you, Kevin. Um, can I touch on the intelligence gathering system as a, a Lanarkshire and MSP? I remember in 2014 there were reports of higher than expected mortality rates in acute hospitals and NHS Lanarkshire. His committee to establish a health intelligence review group, bring in basically a care inspectorate, public uh, ombudsman, uh, Audit Scotland. The intention was to bring up together a, a you know intelligence, what's happening on the ground, what is happening uh, uh, with that group. Uh, where are you with this group at this moment in time? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get Brian to say a, a little bit more about that, but um, just in terms of the background to the group, the reason that the group was set up because of um, a reflection on the deficiencies in England highlighted by Ms Staffordshire, that the failure of national organisations to share intelligence, to respond to intelligence, to act on intelligence was a key aspect of the Francis Inquiry recommendation. So we were on the front foot in Scotland through Healthcare Improvement Scotland in addressing that, but convener if I may, Brian will wish to elaborate. Yes, thanks. So, in fact, that's the group I've just referred to. We didn't, we didn't call it what we were going to call it. We now call it the Sharing Intelligence Group. 
And, and these Sounds six... a bit like the CIA. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. <laughs> no. it wants to make best use of intelligence. Maybe the CIA does or maybe it doesn't. Anyway, um, so these, these, these six agencies, we literally come together um, every two months uh, and we consider, well, in, in Monday, we're actually considering four health boards this coming Monday. Uh, but it's, the, it's not just the data that are in those reports. It's actually the conversation around the table. And you know, such themes as culture, such themes as leadership, such themes as management grip, those sorts of things are the areas that we get as a result of sharing conversations around the table. Now, in, I should say that when all the agencies, these six agencies come together around the table, we have our own governance arrangements. So if there, are, if there are any issues that need to be taken forward or accelerated by, for instance, Audit Scotland, then the Audit Scotland representative around that table takes that back to Audit Scotland and engages with the chief executive and other officers of the, the, the board. Taking on board the clarification that uh, Robbie Pearson uh, made, have there been any, any examples of the new intelligence gathering approach to help to pick up any problems that are uh, coming along? I think the the I'll let Robbie speak in a minute. I think one of the things we're trying to achieve with that group exactly is to get to amber warning systems because at the moment we're operating in a red zone the whole time. And what we'd like in Scotland is to use that group to pick up amber warnings, which we certainly are doing, and Robbie can talk about that in a minute. Ultimately, what we would like uh, boards and IJBs to do is we send out self-assessments and we would like them to tell the truth to themselves and then we would quality assure that. Now we're not anywhere near that stage at the moment. At the moment we're moving from red to amber if you like um, but ultimately that should be our aspiration is to move to each uh, board and integrated joint board doing self-assessments. Do you maybe want to talk about the amber? Um, yeah so, so amber zone, as Denise described it, is, is really important in terms of being there sooner and with the appropriate intervention. And I think some of the examples we've seen in the past have been at that moment when it's, frankly, crisis and an intervention from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So getting there is going to be crucially important in the sharing of intelligence. And one of the key aspects of that is about the quality of the training environment for junior doctors. We now have a wealth of data from the GMC and NHS Education for Scotland survey of the quality of the training. The quality of training is a good indicator about the quality of care. Therefore, we now use that intelligence in a way which I think is much more sophisticated. But Brian may wish to elaborate in terms of how we're actually using it in practice. Yeah. So, so in addition to the amber warning and being um, getting advance notice of anything that could go wrong, um, we also look for bright spots. We look for areas of very good practice that are happening. And of course, we come across them in every report. There are good things happening across um, uh, NHS Scotland and in the integration of health and social care. Um, we, uh, we, are, we meet following the meeting. We meet with the chief executive uh, and the other officers uh, to discuss with them what we find. Um, in fact, we met with NHS Lanarkshire just last week, and not only did the full executive team turn out, but also the chief officer from South, uh, sorry, from North Lanarkshire and officers from South Lanarkshire Integration Joint Board were there. And so we had a very rounded discussion around the areas, both of good practice, uh, but also areas uh, that we wanted them to just be alerted to. So not to hold the, uh, the meeting up, can I ask what the, you know, where do you get this intelligence? From whom do you get it? Is it patients, doctors, staff, uh, reports, a flag up on the internet or whatever, or Twitter? Uh, uh, where do you get this? All, all of the above. All of the above. All, all of the above. And each of these agencies have ways of both their formal inspection or formal review of services from staff experience, from patient experience, and particularly from the Mental Welfare Commission, uh, from relatives' experience uh, of uh, the care of their loved ones. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah, patient you know, opinion is part of the part of the information we look at as well. Marie. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, um, As a, a health professional, I mean, I might be biased because I was involved in writing some sign guidelines, but I do think it's excellent quality. Um, and certainly I became involved in writing the sign guidance because I was involved in, in contributing to the perinatal mental health guidance. And the reason I wanted to be involved was because the first one was practice changing. And I just wondered if you could explain to colleagues 
what the need, I mean, there's an awful lot of bodies producing clinical guidance nowadays. Why does Scotland need to produce its own? So, um, uh, why does Scotland have to produce its own? Because we can and because we can get the appropriate focus, the appropriate priorities. The Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, SIGN Guidelines, has now been in operation for 22 years. Uh, and over that time, we've managed to agree what the priorities are uh, based on evidence, based on patient experience, based, based on good Scottish uh, data uh, from the services. And as you'll have experienced yourself, it's literally a collegiate approach. You have patients, you have expert clinicians, you have jobbing clinicians who just want to go around and do the work, who can tell you what it's really like and how difficult it is to put everything into practice. So you have all of these people around the table. And what, what SIGN does, and um, uh, uh, John Kinsella, who's the current chair of SIGN, is, is making a very clear statement that actually the evidence base is as important now as it's ever been. However, the products have to change. The sign guideline, I don't know how, how, how big your sign guideline was, but the diabetes sign guideline, the sign guideline around uh, cardiovascular uh, care is about an inch to two inches thick. So what do I do? I'm a general practitioner. When I'm seeing patients on a Friday, that's, that's not much use to me. And as a patient with diabetes, that's not much use to you. So what SIGN have done over the past few years has been to change their products, make it more simple, simple messages, uh, both for patients and also for, for clinicians. Now, if we just linked in with all the other guidelines producers across the world, would we get as good a service, as, as, as detailed and as bespoke for Scotland? We would not. However, we do link in with all of those, those uh, networks. And the, the, the somewhat humorously titled GIN, which is the Guidelines International Network, uh, meets regularly. And SIGN has a key role in that to learn from others. But the products are changing. And John Kinsella uh, and our team in, in, in SIGN are fully prepared for the products uh, changing. Indeed, and in fact, our, the sign guidance that I contributed to was one of the first to produce a patient version, mm -hmm. which meant that there was a plain English version um, to help people to make these very difficult decisions about taking drugs during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Indeed. So um, I was personally delighted with that yeah. outcome. Yeah. I, I don't think we should ever underestimate in Scotland the... Um, amazing generosity of staff and the public to contribute to these things mm -hmm. because these are unpaid posts um, in their spare time and I'm sure you did that as well on evenings mm -hmm. and everything else and I think that's a major advantage in Scotland that we have that people will give their time up um, because they genuinely want something to be improved. And I think I mean it's going to turn into a bit of a loving because we actually see the improvement come out the other end. <laughs> it does encourage yes. us to contribute. Yes. I said the reason I got involved the first time was because it was a practice changing guideline first time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, we pushed the boundaries again with the second one. So really, um, it, it was a good experience for me. And it does co co contribute to clinical improvement on the ground because I am a jobbing clinician. I worked mm -hmm. as a pharmacist in mental health and went to call mm -hmm. that good practice back to where I worked. The other thing I wanted to ask about was the um, patient safety improvement programme, which um, again has been, uh, for, as a jobbing clinician, a very, very positive experience to get involved with. So we have felt empowered to make changes in a way that we haven't in the past. Um, we are doing you know, stuff like medicines reconciliation. I worked in mental health, an area where it's very difficult to get change because the risks are huge. And it was you know, a, a very positive experience. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what's happening on the ground in, in mental health, for example. I know there's a number of patient safety improvement programmes in the hospital that I worked in right up until last May. So to take the mental health uh, patient safety programme as, as an example, we have focused in our initial work on acute inpatient wards um, and we've had very clear aims around reducing levels of restraint, reducing levels of physical violence, reducing levels of self-harm um, and I think our chair talked about some of the data from, from that. 
uh, across Scotland where we have seen on wards really quite significant reductions. And the key to us has been that this has been about working with local clinicians, um, involving the service user patient voice as part of it. Um, and I think we're particularly proud in the mental health work about the extent to which the service user voice has been weaved in. We have developed in Scotland the first ever service user assessed um, safety climate tool. So we have a, a tool where we can actually ask patients on the ward, how safe do you feel? And ask a number of questions. And on the back of that, we're able to identify areas to focus improvement work. Um, and I think just looking for some of the data in terms of the impact of that work, it's been uh, improvements in rates of reduction of violence up to 78%, restraint up to 57%, and individual self-harming up to 70%. So this is significant improvements for some of our most vulnerable individuals. We've got a big challenge, though, because we've been given money on for CAM services to, to start to look at um, the child and adolescent services. And I think one of the huge issues that we've got in Scotland is um, the, the, the time you wait at the top end for very specialist services. And I think at the moment our challenge is to start to look more at pathways. Um, and so looking at, in, in the integrated space, what kind of pathways can we put in for children that they don't have to constantly access the most specialist care in child and adolescent psychiatry so I think that's going to be we're just beginning this work and I think we've got huge challenges to start to move that forward patient voice involved in setting that agenda and driving it forward Yes, although one of the irritations, we have a board member who is, is very vocal about children and um, because as she constantly points out to us that we don't have any children on the board. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're still working on, on that one. But it's, it, it's an area that's it, it's difficult. We've focused on older people. Now we need to focus on children. And Brian, if you wanted to say something. Oh, are you going to talk about children? No, I'm not going to talk about children. No. So I, I'm just going to be Yeah, OK. okay. So just an example of how the patient voice is being linked into that CAMS work, and this is work in Grampian, uh, where they've actually developed a young ambassador peer support model as part of their child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and that's where a young person in recovery from a mental health issue actually joins the clinician at the point of the first assessment um, with the young person coming in. So it's a really innovative model. Um, and we are watching closely in terms of the impact of that and then we'll be sharing the learning from that across Scotland. I just wanted to say just one thing about another evidence base which is to your field of medicines but actually of course medicines are not much to do with pharmacists actually it's most to do with patients and prescribers in terms of in terms of doctors but we've produced all sorts of now uh, it's all sorts of leaflets and uh, materials so that the public better understand both the advantages of the medicines but also when things are could be becoming unsafe with the medicines so in fact from Highland uh, itself you you uh, inv invented um, the worker out Lead, 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 leading the way around, around giving cards out to, to family members to, to stop medications when you're having diarrhea or vomiting or you're particularly unwell. And that's making a big difference to acute kidney injury, one of the biggest issues that we now face in modern healthcare. Uh, and another just a wonderful example that we're now just uh, working through the Aid of Drugs and Therapeutics Committee is this uh, just not sure, just ask about starting new medicines. So this, is, this has come from Tayside, and one of our roles in Healthcare Improvement Scotland is to share best practice. So this is now being circulated and distributed out through pharmacies, through GP practice, through libraries uh, and other uh, outlets near you. <laughs> yeah. Miles. Thank you, Pamina, and uh, good morning to the, the panel. Um, I wanted to follow up on Alison Johnson's question, specifically with regards to senior management in the health service. Um, do you think we've got the right people in place? Do you think they have the right skills and the, the past and experience to actually take forward what is going to be a period of major reform in our health service? And specifically around the recruitment process in Scotland, how do you think the pool of people we recruit towards senior management, is that wide enough? And actually, that sometimes is key to taking forward that reform in the health service, to have that leadership, and do you have concerns around that? We can kick off at least. In terms of the context, um, it is changing. So the traditional um, NHS um, Scotland, uh, 
where um, a simple line from an NHS board all the way up to St Andrew's House is now obviously changing in the context of health and social care. So there's a much greater diversity of participants um, contributing to the leadership of health and social care than ever existed um, before. So to, to, to answer your, your question slightly indirectly, I think it's about what are the skills we now need for, for the future. They are less about command and control, frankly, if ever that was effective. It's now about influencing, it's about negotiation, it's working with a much wider uh, range of partners with different perspectives, different cultures and different history, and that will require a different approach to leadership. But that was just a, a general sort of reaction to the question. I think, just to add to that, I mean, I think we need to start looking at, and, and certainly people are starting to look at it, how we train leaders uh, across the whole public sector, because the skills we're looking for um, in a Chief Exec and a Health Board now are really about transformation change, strategic planning, um, and that doesn't always require a health background and the same in education. And um, So I think we should be looking much more in the public sector at leadership development uh, across that. Everywhere you go across the UK, um, everyone is struggling with succession planning and recruitment. Um, and I think we've got the similar kind of headaches here. But we, I think the, the, the easiest way to resolve it at the moment um, is actually about trying to grow some of our own within Scotland. And I think that that's going to have to be the way forward. I don't know, Brian, you're involved in... Yeah, so, so maybe Ruth might want to say something about the development programme for the non-executives. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So it's, maybe I could just make a point that the management of the NHS, the management of any healthcare system is extremely complex. The partnership between managers and clinicians is critically important. If you look at all the failings that's happened in the NHS in the UK, there's been a breakdown in management and clinician relationships. So one of the areas that we are focusing on is that that arrangement. And if you look to, for instance, NHS Lanarkshire now, there's a very clear tripartite model running, for instance, the hospitals with a chief nurse, a chief medic, and a chief manager. You know who's in charge, they work very closely together, and they're responsible for the care. Can I come back? Just another point, which since I was elected as an MSP in May, um, one of the factors I've been incredibly concerned about is what seems to be a postcode lottery across Scotland for health services, and one which I believe is ever increasing. And so in terms of your experience of our health service, would you say that you'd back up that, that actually we're seeing a, a postcode lottery with many services, some health boards doing really well, others certainly not in some key areas? Variation, aren't you? <laughs> we, we certainly see a level of variation across Scotland. What's important is to understand what sits behind that variation because sometimes the variation is based on differences in uh, local needs. It can be based in differences in local population profiles um, and in that case it's good variation. Part of what we're trying to do now is to really get better data around the variation and then support our system to understand what sits behind it. And how are you driving that forward though? Because I think one thing which when we have mm -hmm. FOIs come back, when we ask parliamentary questions, is you see over years a worsening situation and that postcode lottery sometimes getting worse. And as we've heard already today, sometimes key individuals in a health board can drive real improvement in some mm -hmm. area where they have specific interest. So how are you as an organisation making sure that every health board starts to improve in that way and we share knowledge because we keep hearing as a committee that we have lots of pilot studies going on but they don't mm -hmm. get beyond pilot study. So, so there's a number of things we're doing. Firstly, key to this is transparency around the data, and we're working very closely with our colleagues in ISD. Um, we have a new programme that we're getting up and running called the Effective Care Programme, and its focus is on reducing unwarranted variation in uh, clinical processes or clinical interventions. It starts from the point of saying, what is the data telling us about where the key variations are? And then working with the health boards, with the clinicians around the skills, to then understand what's at the root cause of that variation and where it is unacceptable differences in practice that we then work with them to address that. And that also then pulls in the evidence guidelines as well. Do you have any cases of that then where you've specifically made an improvement? So I think uh, specific improvements through the patient safety work because a lot of that patient safety work 
was around identifying areas where there were inappropriate variation in practice um, across the system. Um, and certainly the work, and Brian could talk to this about, um, on the acute side around the VAPs. So, so, so the initial work was around the ventilator associated pneumonia and just highlighting that actually if you really concentrate on patients who are, are on ventilators, you can eradicate this fatal condition. 50% of people that got a ventilator associated pneumonia died. Mm -hmm. So we, we studied that in Tayside. We then rolled that out by sharing experience. So part of our, our um, opportunity here in Scotland is to share best practice. And it is commonly, a phrase that's commonly used elsewhere in the world is that we have the best care, however we don't have the best care everywhere. And I see a commitment in the delivery plan to develop an atlas of variation and atlases of variation have been things that have significantly driven widespread change in other countries. And we've, we are certainly very keen to work uh, with ISD and Scottish Government around the atlas of variation. Thank you. Claire? Uh, thank you, convener. And I uh, sort of pick up a little bit on, on uh, what you were talking about there and what Marie Todd was talking about. Again, I, I need to declare a, an interest. I'm a, a mental health nurse and um, certainly have used sign guidelines to improve my clinical practice and hopefully improve the outcomes for, for the, the patients that I, I uh, treated. Um, we have heard at this committee, though, that there's been lots of pilots run in lots of health boards or lots of IGIBs, which uh, produce great outcomes um, and great patient satisfaction rates and clinicians are really pleased with them, but concerned that those are seen in silos and that that practice isn't rolled out. And you've touched a little bit on that. Perhaps you could maybe tell us a bit how you sort of scoop up all that good practice and make sure that it is disseminated across the country. Yeah. It's about spread, actually, because it's such a mm. difficult problem. This. Yeah. yeah. So there are a range of approaches that we use to spreading the good practice. A part of it is around networking and pulling individuals together who are working on these issues. Um, we increasingly produce tools and guidance to support implementation at a local level. The use of data is really important in terms of highlighting areas where it's working well. Um, and then we pull together case studies and share those across the system. Um, so it is a range of methods that we use. I think the challenge is in improvement work that you can't just take something from one area and transplant it into another area because context really matters. And the key is to understand what was it about the area that delivered the improvements that led to that improvement and then supporting the translation of that practice into another area and being uh, appropriately adapted into that context. And again, we'd say we are studying those that are trying to do this around the world. We run a webinar series called QI Connect. Every month we bring together um, 48 different countries, more than 500 organisations for a one-hour webinar. And we've run that now for three years. I would say that easily half of those webinars talk about the point you're just raising. How do you move beyond pilots? How do you, how do you, why don't good things spread? Mm -hmm. Uh, and what we're doing is not just studying that in an academic way, we're actually putting it into practice, as Ruth says. The more that we can get leadership and management and professional bodies around the table with us, the more that they can feel responsible for actually having consistent practice where the evidence is, is there, uh, the better. And that's certainly something we're studying uh, along with many others around the world. Can I, can I also ask briefly, convener, I know, I know we're tight for time, um, this uh, Scottish Patient Safety uh, Programme particu worked particularly well, I think, because it was bottom-up rather than top-down. You're talking about leadership, and yes, leadership is, is really important, and we need to know who's in charge and who's accountable. But how are you capturing some of that good practice from at the coalface clinicians and using that to drive some of the improvements that, you, that you're uh, seeking? And, and would completely agree that importance of the bottom up. Uh, we talk about one of the challenges of spread is that we're trying to spread solutions to problems that people don't know they have. So it's absolutely crucial at that local level to do the work to diagnose what their key quality improvement issues are and then support them to make the changes. And part of what we do across a range of our improvement programmes is work with local areas to capture case studies, to share those. We are 
increasingly using videos now, so you can go online and watch a range of short video stories that capture what's been done and the improvements that have been delivered. As I say, we do the networking events. We do a lot actually just through the individual discussions. Um, so we will go into an area, they may face a challenge, and we'll say, actually, we know that that board just next to you has already faced this and solved it, so we'll connect individuals together um, and enable them to learn from each other. That's why quality assurance and improvement are important together, because we have the authority to say in an area, this is what's working well for you, these are the areas you could improve on. And I think that that's the way you can then say that with authority that drives the improvement. Whereas I think regulation for regulation's sake just won't drive that improvement. And just, just add very, very briefly to say that every one of our programmes that's dealing with a clinical area has a national clinical lead. So we now have 53 or 54 national clinical leads across our, our programme. These are people who work for us one day a week or two days a week, but the rest of the time they're in practice. And that's a whole range from, from nursing staff to medical staff, pharmacists, AHPs uh, who are involved in our work. Thank you. Um, just two very final brief things. If we get you back in a year, what will be your big achievement? Well, I, I think actually um, our big achievement would, would be that we've actually convinced you that having an amazing organisation that does quality insurance and improvement works better than anything else you've seen in the rest of the world in driving improvement in healthcare. And when we come back, we would give you a lot more data to actually support that. Okay. And finally, um, Denise, you said that we need an open and honest debate about funding the future of the health service. You also said that we need to, um, people need to tell the truth to themselves um, and that you're an independent organisation. So maybe in the spirit of independence, telling the truth and open and honest debate, I wonder if you could give us a, um, your view on whether you see cuts to services happen in the NHS and social care field across Scotland. Well, I think you said it's it's about funding. I think it's about how we use our funding. I think um, for us as an organisation, we have to live with the reality across the Western world at the moment um, that funding is going to be tight, whatever we do. I think that's the, not, not no, the question no, I asked. I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, is not really about cuts to services. I think it's about changing services. No, but could you answer the question that I asked? Do, is, are you seeing health and social care across Scotland? You, you're probably yes. One of the best people yes. that we can ask yeah, this absolutely. question to. And actually, it's not about cuts to services. I would reiterate that, actually. It's about people actually shifting resource. And in fact, in some areas, it's about taking some money out of areas and putting not even the whole amount back. So it's not particularly about cuts. I think it's definitely about shifting um, resource and also deciding as the public in Scotland, what we actually want to spend our money on. So I think it's about, um, I think we could drive ourselves down a negative ragbit hole by saying it's about cuts. I think what we need to say is actually we can do a lot better with the money we actually have at the moment. So uh, there aren't any cuts happening? I'm not discussing that. I'm talking about doing better with the money we have at the moment. So, so <laughs> you know, I was hoping that the words you use to describe your organisation would come across, but I've asked you a question that I would hope you would give us a straightforward answer, but unfortunately that's... Well, I think that's a straightforward that, answer. I think the straightforward anyway, answer thank is you doing very much. things better. Thank you all very much for this morning. That's been very helpful, and we will suspend briefly for a change of panel.
Hi, the second item on the agenda is evidence session on the transplantation authorisation of remo removal of organs, etc. Scotland Bill. Um, and we're going to uh, hear from uh, Mark Griffin, uh, who's uh, in charge of the draft proposal, and Andrew Milne, the uh, clerk and team to the non government uh, bills unit in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Mark, we invite you to give an opening statement. Thanks, Kavina. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for um, having me along that committee today. Um, today, you'll have in front of me of you my proposal for a member's bill on a soft opt-out process for organ donation and the statement of reasons that goes along with it as to why I think that I shouldn't have to go out to consultation again um, before introducing a, a final proposal. The reason that I've brought forward um, a member bill proposal, my own personal reasons were that um, my father, when I was um, 12, was diagnosed with a heart condition um, and was told that he needed a heart transplant. He waited 10 years for a transplant, got one, but wasn't strong enough after 10 years to of the, the decline that his body went through after being on the the relevant drugs and everything else, that he wasn't strong enough to make it through that operation um, and died when I was 22. So I have really strong personal reasons behind this bill. And, uh, members around the table, uh, Richard Lyle amongst others, will know exactly the situation that uh, my family and I were in and why I've brought this proposal um, today. I feel that, um, aside from the policy behind the, the proposal, that there is already a wealth of information out there, a wealth of research, um, a number of consultation exercises that have already um, gone ahead that means anything that I do um, won't add anything new and would actually might even be counterproductive. Uh, we might be in a situation where people are being over consulted and they're almost getting fed up of being consulted and actually just want us to get on and decide whether we're going to do something or not. And Anne McTaggart, who had the previous um, proposal, she went out to consultation in 2014. Uh, the previous committee had a consultation on the issue in October 2015, and the government themselves are running their consultation, which started in 2016. And that's three consultations in three years. Um, I really don't see the need to have a fourth con consultation of my own um, in that same space of time. I've seen the list of the, the, the organisations and individuals that the government have gone out to consultation with, and I think that's a fantastic list. Um, I wouldn't be adding to that list, um, and I wouldn't be getting any more information than I think the government have or, or will, already, will already have received and be in the process of um, receiving. If, if the committee were to approve um, statement of reasons, that would give me permission to lodge a final proposal within Parliament. But I don't think that would be appropriate and that I wouldn't lodge any proposal until the government have concluded their own consultation and decided whether or not they would take forward any legislation. So I hope to be informed by the government's consultation as well, um, rather than trying to short-circuit that process. Um, but I'm happy, happy to take questions, Convener, on the statement of reasons today. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Any questions from members? Alex. Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed for um, your presentation. I think none of us can fail to have been moved by your personal reasons for, for bringing the bill forward. Um, you rightly point out that we've had or will have had three consultations um, in as many years. In terms of the first two, um, w was there much variance in terms of the, the what was what came back from the public? Um, in both consultations, I mean, Anne's consultation had almost 600 responses, and the committee's res uh, consultation um, had individual responses and a survey of almost uh, 900 responses, and those came back broadly in favour of the proposal. Um, public opinion, there have been a number of polls conducted by British Heart Foundation, um, which have all come back in favour um, of a move towards an opt-out system. Um, but, I mean, today we're talking about whether there's a need for another consultation or not. Exactly. Um, and, and I think another one would be 
I think it would and be counterproductive. I'm certainly of a mind with you on that. I think that you, you rightly point out, particularly in the very moving case of your father, how important time is in this entire agenda. And I think that anything that delays a possible legislative change um, will be measured out in human lives. And, and so I'm very much minded to support your case here. And should there be no further questions, I would like to move that we back you on this. Uh, Colin. So much can be done on that. You touched on the fact that there was um, three consultations, two that have already been conducted uh, and one that's planned by the government. Is there any organisation or any person within those three consultations, uh, in, in particular the one planned by the government, that you think is not being consulted? No, I think there have been three extensive consultations. And in fact, a private member's bill, uh, by virtue of it being my own private office, if I was to get to consultation with just the resources of my, my own office compared to the office um, of the government and the range of civil service advisers, the publicity budgets that they have. I can't see any consultation that I would carry out um, having as big a reach as the government's one. So I think it would inevitably be a smaller, um, far less reaching consultation, which wouldn't um, give as much, um, as many responses and as, as much information as the government would already. Uh, Richard, do you? Mark, uh, I personally know your, your personal reasons behind it. I was actually a good f uh, friend of your dad's, as you know, um, and had to go through the same pain that your family had to go through at the time. But can I ask for the record, right, when did you lodge your bill, and did you know at the time that the Scottish Government was also tabling a consultation on, on this? Yep, I lodged my bill in December, um, 19th of December. Um, I lodged the proposal along with the statement of reasons and I did know that the government were carrying out a consultation. Now, I hope, um, and I believe that the government will bring forward um, legislation on opt-out and they will have my full support um, for doing that. What, um, what I'm doing, the, the reason I'm doing this and what I hope doesn't happen is that after the government carries through a consultation that they decide not to proceed with legislation. Um, and I'm going through this process so that if at the end of that process the government decide not, this isn't right, we decide not to take us forward, that I'll be in a position to pick up the ball and to, to move forward um, with my own proposal. In the previous session, I had a bill on British Sign Language. I introduced that in my first year after being elected and it took four years to get from first introducing to passing that legislation. So um, if the government were to decide, to decide not to, and I was to pick up a private member's bill fresh, um, already over a year into par the parliamentary session, um, then maybe there'd be difficulty with the timetable and getting that passed in this individual session. So I decided to, to run um, that in tandem and like I said, if, if the government's uh, consultation concludes and they decide to bring forward their own legislation, fantastic, they'll have my full support. Um, but if not, and I'll, I'll give them the time um, to come to their own conclusion, but if not, then this process is to run in tandem so that I'm ready to, to take forward my own proposal if they decide not to. The greatest respect to a number of members on this committee now, I, I was on the Health Committee last session, and basically we went through this and I actually travelled along with Duncan McNeil to Madrid to see the, the Spanish system. And there were quite a lot of concerns about Anne Taggart's bill. And Anne Taggart, again, I would say I was uh, a very nice lady. Uh, but unfortunately, during the time that the vote was held, the, basically the government did give the commitment that they would bring forward a bill. So knowing that, and knowing, sorry to tell me the pain again, but knowing your personal you know, history and with your father. Um, why did you feel that you had to pick it up? Was it mainly because, you know, you agree, you know, and, and the point of you, with your father, and I do apologise for asking it that way, um, but basically, you know, I'm interested to know because the government did give a commitment in the last session that they would bring forward a bill in this session, and they have tabled basically a consultation and just to finish off, convener, 
you said, can, I, I, can you reiterate, you're basically saying that if the government carry forward this, you will hold back and wait until they table a bill and then you will move and work along with the government to get that bill to... Because, it, quite honestly, Mark, we all want it. I want it, you want it. I'm sure everybody sitting in this room wants it. Um, but with the greatest respect, Antaggart's bill the last time was flawed. And that's why I didn't vote for it. And, I, and I'm, I, I'm totally agreeing with, you know, you know, carrying this bill on. But that's why I didn't vote for it in the last session. Yep. Well, in the previous session, the government made a commitment to go out to consultation, um, and that's what they've done. I'm not aware that the government actually made a consultation to legislate for an opt-out um, system. Um, if they do and they table their own bill, like you said, I'll say, fantastic, I'll get right behind it. Um, that will end any involvement from me in a private member's bill perspective, and I'll support them in any way that I can. Um, this is purely... Um, almost as a, a safeguard that if the government decide not to take forward legislation, um, that I will come in with my own private members bill. But I hope that they do and they'll have my full support if they do so. Thank you and sorry for putting you through that. Point, Alec, briefly. Thank you, convener. Just on that, you know, irrespective of whether the government made a con commitment to consult or to legislate, I fully endorse Mark's position as a kind of um, stopping block for that because in 2012 and do the right thing, the report to the UNCRC about the implementation of children's rights in Scotland, the then Minister for Children made a commitment to legislate for the age of criminal responsibility in the last parliament, and yet that didn't happen. So I think it's absolutely right that in a kind of belt and braces fashion that Mark takes this twin pack track approach, but in good faith that the Scottish Government will make good on that commitment and will work alongside them. So absolutely endorse his position today. Um, uh, thank you, Mark, for, for coming along today, and thanks for explaining the, the why now, which was one of my questions, was the, the why now. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you, you're saying that there's, there's su sufficient evidence already, or sufficient consultation, and it's just a bit about some of the consultation that's already been done. Obviously, the Scottish Government's out of consultation at the moment, so we can't use that as, as evidence that we don't need consultation for, for your private member's bill. And I'm looking at this from a, from a purely health professional point of view. Um, so there, there were two previous consultations. Was that what you were saying? There was the one for Anne McTaggart's bill? Anne McTaggart carried out a consultation and the Health Committee carried and, out their the own consultation. Com well, the Health Committee carried out, from, from what I can see there, it was an, an online survey, a self-selecting online survey um, of about 900 people. Um, with the and the the online survey from from the information I can see there from the health uh, and sport committee at the time um, was uh, very much it was uh, promoted by organisations who were actively uh, campaigning for an opt out um, bill um, and the previous uh, private members bill consultation there was five hundred and fifty nine respondents is that right yep. yeah um, of which there were five hundred and twenty nine individuals and 30 organisations and from my, from my reading there of, of the consultation the organisations which were varied church organisations professional bodies and um, those actually involved in transplantation were quite split over that over the the consultation that was there can you maybe give me a bit of a, a flavour of your rationale for why you feel those consultations are sufficient not for you not to have to go back and consult with the public yep the the proposal that I have tabled is, is the same as Anne's proposal, so mm -hmm. I'd be going out to consultation um, with the same people, with the same proposal, and in all likelihood getting the same responses. The committee um, did have an, on an online survey, which mm -hmm. you could say was self-selecting, but any consultation, the government's consultation, it'll be a self-selecting audience. They did have organisations respond to that um, call for evidence by committee, six health boards, the General Medical Council, UK Donations Ethics Committee, Scottish Donation and Transplant Group, um, Nuffield Council and Bioethics. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't just individuals. There's sure. some yeah. Yeah. Um, pretty big organisations who have a lot of experience in the field. Mm -hmm. So uh, if uh, you would be putting out the same questions that then resulted in a flawed bill, I don't see, I can't quite find or follow the logic in that? Would you not look at, at trying to explore other areas? I'm just thinking there's been advances in medical technology since uh, 2015 in terms of tissue transplant, um, transplant of limbs, things like that. That Would you not look at covering some of those areas as well in, in a consultation if you had to go and do that? Well, 
the consultation, the, the, the proposal that I've tabled is a one-line proposal. And just because the, the one-line proposal was the same as Anne's doesn't mean that the, the bill at the end of um, that would be introduced would be the same as Anne's. Certainly, obviously, I would look to um, take advice from the, the committee and um, the evidence that the committee received at this, the last session, the debate that we had in Parliament um, already in discussion with the government and talking about the particular issues that they had um, around Anne's bill and look to introduce a different bill. It certainly wouldn't be uh, the same bill that would be introduced. Okay, um, my, my apologies. I thought that's what, what you had said, so the, the information would be the same. I mean, I, I, I think that this is something that, that we need to get 100% right. Um, I think we, we need to ensure that any any bill that's placed before or uh, before Parliament has to be 100% right, because it's too important not to get right, and we need to get it right the first time. Um, thank you, convener. Yeah, uh, who was next? Alison. Thank you, convener. So can I, just for clarification, um, formally, if the committee votes against your proposal today, we would actually be asking you to carry out a further consultation. So we would then have, well, there seems to be some, uh, you know, discussion here whether two or three consultations have already been carried out. So we would, in effect, be asking for a fourth consultation, um, while you have very reasonably, I would suggest, said that you're very happy to to absorb the government's ongoing consultation at the moment. Yeah, okay, that's correct. Technically, if the committee doesn't agree, then um, they would ask me. I would have two months to go out to. Um, consultation and get go through the, the normal members' bill procedure. Um, I wouldn't conclude that consultation um, by the time um, the government had already concluded their own. So, yeah, four. It would be the fourth consultation in, in three okay. years. And I would probably suggest there be some repetition there, duplication, yeah. and clearly a delay to progress. And I think what concerns me um, is that. Uh, Minister Eileen Campbell says in her letter to the convener that the Scottish Government intends, subject to the outcome of the consultation, um, to bring forward legislation. So there is no guarantee. So it is the case that if the if members of this committee are determined that they would like to see great progress here or guaranteed progress, then we should support your proposal today. Yep, certainly there is no guarantee um, with the government consultation. Um, I, I'm saying that I guarantee that I will bring forward legislation at some point if the government do not. So, yet, if the committee were minded um, to see legislation on opt out, then the only way to guarantee that is is through this process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very Tom, much. Thank you very much for coming along this morning, Mark. I think we all sympathise and commend you for your aims in bringing this forward. Just firstly, and for the record, can you categorically guarantee that you will not make a lodge a formal proposal until not only has the Scottish Government consultation been completed, but they have published their results and analysis? 100%. The, go the Government consultation is due to end in March. Uh -huh. um, I would expect um, a month, maybe two months, until they provided um, responses. It was just the language used was when the consultation closed, which is on the 14th of March. I want to clarify, is it when the consultation closes or when the results are published by the Government? I, I would actually not plan to lodge um, anything in, until even later than that, until the mm -hmm. government come to a firm decision as to whether they will bring forward okay. legislation or not. Thank you. I just wanted to clear that point up. Um, the <coughs> second point I want to ask is if the, consult the consultation isn't specifically on um, an opt-out system or not, it's about how we increase organ donation. And it obviously includes, as Parliament mandated to, uh, to do in, fe in February of last year, to include, have a broad consultation included a, a, um, a consideration of opt-out. Were the consultation to come back and the evidence and analysis to suggest that actually your proposal would not, in the view of the response of the consultation in the government, lead to an increase in organ donation? And that's ultimately what this is about, it's about increasing organ donation. If the consultation were to suggest that that would not be the case, would you still bring forward your member's bill? Yep, there will be consultation responses which support the system, an opt-out system. There will be consultation responses um, against, uh, on a similar basis to Anne's consultation, the committee's consultation. I'm, the, I'm of the personal view that um, a, an opt-out system would increase the number of organs available for transplantations, which would save lives, 
and I'm committed to taking mm -hmm. forward legislation in this parliament on that basis. Uh -huh. I, I appreciate that. It's just that in your statement of reasons, you cite a consultation, and from what you've said, that you've indicated that regardless of the outcome of that consultation and the results, you're going to proceed. Yeah, but the, the government on the same basis. The government will take a view at the end of that consultation as to the merit, which which weight, mm -hmm. how, how much weight they apply to each submission, um, and they'll decide what they do on the basis. Um, they'll agree mm -hmm. and disagree with some responses, and, and they'll plot a course from there. And I'm, I'll be in the same position. I'll agree and disagree with some of the consultation responses, and I've already um, said I'll plot a course to introduce legislation yeah. I, um, I, if the government doesn't. I do appreciate that, but it seems that you're prejudging the consultation in that you're already going to... Law, you, the, only to the only reason you've, su you've suggested that you would not lodge a formal, uh, final proposal it would be where the government to indicate that they were going to legislate. You've not stated that where this consultation to any analysis to demonstrate that this is not the best way to proceed, you would withdraw which suggests that if you're citing the consultation as evidence for your bill, but you're not going to use the consultation because you've already taken this decision, is that really adequate for a statement of reasons? The point I'm making is very clearly the process has been prejudged. Well, the statement of reason relies on consultation that's already been carried out um, by Anne and committee, simply pointing out that asking me to consult on... Okay. On, at the same time as the government's consultation. That's point I want to come back to then, because if we're going to accept that the consultation is, is going to be getting carried out simultaneously, the government consultation is underway, the results of that are ultimately only going to be used if it's supportive of the proposition. It then comes back to the existing consultation that Anne uh, McTaggart had in the previous session, which led to a, a bill that was flawed, which was a view of both this committee and parliament. And I only I ask these questions because I share exactly the same aims. I just want to make sure we get this absolutely right. And I want to know why it is we're being asked to waive a consultation. And if you're citing things such as a Scottish Government consultation, which isn't actually going to have an impact on whether you decide to proceed with this or not. Well, the, 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 the process for a private member's bill is that a, a member will have a particular view on whether legislation is needed to change a situation. They'll then go out to consultation to ask what the public view is, where there's a, a public view for a particular mechanism, whether particular avenues are, are appropriate or not. But at the end of the day, the member um, in charge will still be of the opinion um, that legislation is needed in their consultation is on the mechanism. So I think almost every single consultation, every single private member's exercise in the history of the Parliament will have almost been prejudged because the member who tables it believes strongly in, in that course of action and they go out to consultation um, to, to consult on the mechanisms for doing so. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I'm aware that time's been going on. I'll, I'll, I'll rest on that point. It's the final point I, I wanted to inquire on was your explanation for having lodged a draft um, proposal was to I think to expedite the process for a, a belt and braces approach is Alex Cole Hamilton now that was in the 19th of December but at the end of January and it's already before committee and if this committee accepts your statement of reasons you will then be free to go ahead and lodge a final proposal that's is taken factoring in recess a matter of weeks why did you choose to lodge that proposal before Christmas and not wait until the government had concluded its consultation where you would have all that evidence available in analysis, you would have an, an indication from the government whether or not it wished to legislate. Why not wait until then to lodge a proposal? Um, actually, I, I came back after the election with the intention of lodging a proposal straight away um, and I would have done so except I put a, a a call for a meeting with the, the minister. Um, I didn't want to to table anything and take anything forward without speaking to the minister first because I, I wanted to basically see what the lie of the land was with the government, if there's any way that we could work together. So actually I didn't get that meeting with the minister until November. Um, so we sat down, we we talked through where we, th we felt things could have been changed with Anne's bill, um, how broadly supportive of the government was. So. The reason that a proposal wasn't tabled actually um, in May or June before summer recess was that I thought the best thing to do was actually to sit down with the government first. And the time, timing of this proposal has simply been um, 
wait to meet with the Minister and then go ahead after that discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for coming to see us today. And I think it's worth putting on record um, the work which Anne McTaggart did do, although the bill wasn't successful um, around this. Um, specifically, I wanted to ask, you've said that you've received no assurance from the Minister um, that the government would take forward a bill, and I think that's concerning. But do you feel that there's been any delay um, from the government in, with regards to this? And also, secondly, how do you see your work and that of the Scottish government going on at the same time together um, will actually help eventually deliver a really strong bill which can be supported um, across the parties in Parliament? Um, well, the government have come back and they've, they've come back after the election. They've taken the time to pull together a consultation um, document and gone out to consultation um, within the year since since we've come back, still within that calendar year. So um, they've taken the time to get it right. I think that, that's appropriate, I hope. Um, that's what they'll do right through the process. They'll take the time to get it right and they'll bring forward um, good, strong proposals on an opt-out um, system. I think um, the Minister has said in a recent article that they have a presumption in favour of introducing legislation after the consultation, which is, is excellent. Um, if the government decide to, to take it forward, they'll have the full weight of the civil service behind them, much more resources than I ever would in my private office. And I'll simply say to the Minister, whatever I can do to help, um, give me a call and, and let me know. And that, that would be the extent of my um, support, supporting as much as I could as a backbencher. Uh, Marie. Can I just ask, um, thank you very much for your evidence so far today. Um, I wanted to ask um, specifically about the process of consultation and what the purpose of it is. Um, I'm conscious that the last bill failed and I would imagine that there was an opportunity in a new round of consultation to look at the specific areas on which the last bill failed to hopefully inform the development of a new bill which was stronger and more robust and less likely to fail, more likely to succeed. Is that not the purpose of consultation? Well, th I wouldn't be going out to consultation on, on a bill, so there wouldn't be a bill ready to go out and for people to say... I don't. I, I agree with section one. I don't agree with section two. I could amend part of section three. The, the consultation would simply be on that one-line proposal, and I think the committee and government have already said that they commended the aims um, of Anne's bill, which is effectively that one-line proposal. So the the meaningful discussion on actually the content of the bill happened in here in committee and in the chamber um, when there was debate around. Um, a specifics um, of a bill um, and at this stage um, without having a bill drafted to go out to consultation that you just wouldn't generate that same level of discussion it, it would be um, a consultation purely on that um, one line proposal which would generate much similar response to what's we've already have All right so there wouldn't be any opportunity to drill down into the particular feelings of the last bill at all N not until you had uh, um, I mean, you could have pre-legislative discussion with government and civil service, yeah. um, but the way the bill process works is that um, you would lodge a one-line proposal to go out to consultation, then you would come back after that consultation, have an analysis of the consultation, and then um, send away a policy document to um, a legal draftsman who would then draft a bill for introduction to Parliament. Okay. I just wonder if it's worth, I mean, I didn't look at the particular consultation that occurred in Wales and whether it was a more robust process than that, but I was struck by the numbers. So our consultation last time around got 500 and something responses. Wales, which has a smaller population, got nearly 3,000 responses. And to me, that strikes me as a much more robust consultation and that might just be why their legislation passed in Wales um, that's my concern and uh, you know if we, if if everyone around the table is agreed that what we want is for a successful bill to be tabled is there something that we could look at there I would agree and I think the reason the the Welsh bill and the Welsh, Welsh consultation has so many responses was because it was a government bill so I had the full, Do you would expect the full weight 3, of government. They had a, <laughs> a PR one. department and a budget for publication um, to get so many responses. If I was going out to consultation, I would be using the exact same resources you have in terms of two or three members of staff, maybe 
post on, on Facebook, social media to try and get it out there. But with the best form in the world, I'm just not going to reach as many people as um, the government will do. Um, and that's another reason I think that um, the government consultation will be a better place to, to, to seek a much wider range of responses. That's why I wouldn't do anything until that exercise is concluded and the government have taken a decision as to whether they carry, carry go forward with legislation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Ivan, yeah. It's really a question then about procedure and timing, so I, I don't know if you, if you can answer it or, 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 or it may, may require the, the, the committee clerks to comment. Um, my understanding is that the stage you're at at the moment, um, you're bringing forward the proposal um, and then you bring forward a final proposal after that uh, and then a clock starts ticking, I think, for a month. Um, but you've undertaken not to do that until such times as the government's um, consultation is finished and that they've commented on that. Um, given that, my understanding therefore is that if you were to proceed at this stage, even if the committee was to agree at this stage um, to what you're proposing, then there's no time lost because you're going to be sitting waiting anyway. Um, is there an option that, um, given some of the, the concerns that have been raised uh, and, and your commitment not to proceed until the consultation comes back, that we defer at this stage, and you come back later in March when the consultation's finished with the same proposal for us to move forward or not? Is that an option? Or procedurally, is that an option? And um, I think and maybe the clerks would correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think procedurally the committee has to make a decision within a certain time scale, and I think that time right. scale passes at the February recess. Okay. And so it has to make a decision before recess whether you ask me to go out to consultation um, or not. I mean, you could ask me to go out to consultation again. I would go out and carry out that consultation exercise, but as uh, Marie, Marie Todd points out, that the government consultation that, that is running at the same time will have a much wider reach um, okay. and a much bigger budget, and I would expect a much higher response rate than I would be able to, to generate through my own private office. So running both at the same time, um, I think probably... No, that's, 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 that's good. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, Mark, thanks very much. And, uh, Andrew, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, as agreed, we'll now take the next uh, item in private.